Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a pleasure for me to be here once again. I thank the uh, Centro for inviting me and Luigi Paper. At the same time, I damned him because I didn't want to lecture, but he made me lecture on partial differential equations, and I didn't know very much about the history of the whole thing. So you will hear, well, you will see what you hear. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I'm not talking about all of partial differential equations, but uh, about Lagrange's contributions to partial differential equations of first order. And uh, just let me recall the simple problem. There is given a function, it's a box, so to say, in which one puts into uh, the solution. This function is f of x, c, and p. x and p are in Rn, so these are always n variables, and c is a scalar variable, and we have a partial differential equation, so n should be at least 2. And then the first problem would be determine all the real-valued solutions uh, which one imagines as a surface C as a function of x, u of x, such that the equation f of x, u of x, and the gradient of u, ux, uh, is zero for all x in a certain domain in Rn. And uh, x stands for the n variables x1 up to xn, and uh, the gradient are the partial de de uh, derivatives. And the old notation sometimes, probably most times, authors write f of x, u, and p. Yeah, p stands for gradient of u, uh, meaning that uh, differential minus pk dxa is zero, uh, pk the partials, and uh, summation with respect to double appearing indices k from 1 to m. And uh, let me give a brief outline uh, about what I want to talk. Uh, <clears throat> the whole story more or less begins with Euler, but I will not talk very much about Euler. Uh, my uh, main interest, first interest is Lagrange. Four papers in the Nouveau Memoir of the Berlin Academy uh, from 1772, 84, 79, and 85. Uh, and one lecture in his Leçon sur la fonction analytique uh, in the second edition from 1806. It's the lecture 21. Uh, and uh, uh, let me say just briefly what's in these papers. In the first one, he treats the problem of finding solutions for this equation for n equals 2. Uh, in 74, uh, about which will I mention only briefly, it's more or less not any more so much valued is my impression today. Also, it's a very long paper. Uh, there he introduces complete solutions, general solutions, particular solutions, whatnot. Uh, I will try to explain why he introduced these notions. And then comes uh, two papers, 79 and 85. Uh, <coughs> where he treats linear and quasi-linear uh, partial differential equations of first order. And uh, the problem he takes up from 72 in 1806. Uh, now, the, the gist of this story is in 72 he derives uh, a method to attack the problem which is in the first line of this page. Uh, but he stops at a certain point. And the main contribution in this paper seems to be 
what already Euler had noticed, but Euler didn't stress it. But Lagrange really stresses it, namely that he can uh, derive a certain equation which is a, a quasi-linear equation for a, a wanted function with one more independent variable. And it turns out Lagrange had solved the problem completely uh, in his papers 79 and 85. However, uh, in the papers 79 and 85, it seems he had forgotten uh, what he had done in his first paper. And also Monge had forgotten what, uh, uh, what Lagrange had done. Thank you. And uh, so the, the thing is, Lagrange had solved the solution problem for two independent variables finally after so many years, but he didn't notice that he had solved the problem. I will talk a little bit more about this. And uh, now, how did the whole thing proceed? In 84, uh, Sharpie uh, wrote a long paper where he solved the problem, it seems, the general problem from the first line, uh, but uh, this paper was never published. I don't know why. Uh, maybe because the whole thing came into the revolutionary times. Uh, there is only one uh, notice uh, I think in lectures by Lacroix, where he describes the, the, the outline of, of this paper. Uh, now, uh, when did Lagrange notice that he had solved the problem? Uh, he must have uh, found out sometime later, because in Lesson 21, in 1806, there he describes the method. Uh, and my historical knowledge is so limited, I couldn't find a place. The only thing is that in the books by Gretton Guinness, I have read that in 93, so during the terror, the height of the terror, Lagrange had studied Sharpie's paper. And here, certainly at this point realized what he had missed. And so then later, uh, 13 years later, he uh, presented the whole thing in the lesson. Uh, whether he had found it only at this occasion or at an earlier occasion, maybe some learned hist historian uh, can tell me uh, how the situation was. Anyway, in 1814, 1815, the first printed publication appeared about the general solution of uh, the problem from the first line by Pfaff. Uh, Pfaff at that time was no longer professor at Helmstedt, where he had promoted Gauss in absentia to the doctor, uh, to the doctor degree. Uh, because that was after the Napoleonic troubles and uh, so many universities in Germany disappeared. Uh, <coughs> well, uh, and then I come to some achievement which I really think is very beautiful. This is Koshi's paper, uh, how he approaches the the problem via boundary, uh, via initial value problems. And this paper for two independent variables appeared in 1819. And uh, he announced that he would uh, do the general solution for any dimensions later, but it took him more than 20 years until he published it in the exercises and some papers I have forgotten. Uh, the general solution, and somehow what Cauchy did 
moved in this general literature somehow distorted and changed and so on. And uh, uh, the one who says, I restored the, the whole thing for what Koshi did in his whole beauty, this did Caradeodori in his book on partial differential equations and calculus of variations in 1935. But I should mention that uh, in, th in the second half of the 19th century there was Sophus Lee. He had invented the contact geometry and the theory of contact transformations. And in the book, uh, which he wrote with his assistant Sheffers uh, on Berührungstransformationen, contact transformations, he gives a beautiful presentation of what Lagrange had done of all papers. And if one really wants to, s to understand it in geometrical terms, what is behind the elimination and differentiation procedures that Lagrange had proceeded, uh, one should read uh, this, but I will not have time. Of course, there are many other people, uh, famous people who've worked on partial differential equations of first order. First of all, there is Monge. He will be barely mentioned by myself. He gave Lac Lagrange's presentation is completely analytical, and Monge made with his cones uh, a beautiful geometric description, which I will more or less skip. And then there are these, uh, I'm nearly tempted to say, infinitely many papers by Jacobi on uh, partial differential equations. Uh, uh, Sophus Lee writes about these papers after what Koshi had done. I don't know why Jacobi wrote that many papers. He did n present nothing new, uh, which is uh, certainly an overstatement, but I cannot help a certain grain of truth is in that. Koshi's paper is really uh, a magnificent thing. So let me start with, uh, I will see how far I will get with the whole thing. So here I come to the first paper, the 72 paper. Uh, I should mention that this lesson uh, 21 was uh, written down from what I have read already in 1799. Uh, I found it amazing that uh, Lagrange was able to read Sharpie's manuscript in the middle of the revolution but mathematicians obviously can do uh, whatever happens <laughs> anywhere under any circumstances. Uh, <coughs> at least mathematicians like Lagrange. Uh, so he introduces the notion of a general solution. From this paper one doesn't quite understand what this general solution is. So z is a function of x and y and then of a parameter alpha, but not just of a parameter, but of a general function of this parameter. It's a kind of method of variation, what he proceeds. I will try to explain this a little bit later. So, of course, one cannot always solve this equation. If f is a positive function, there's no hope to make it zero. Uh, or if it does not depend on ux and uy, it doesn't make much sense to speak of a partial differential equation. It's, a, it's just an, an equation between dependent and independent variables. So I'm not, uh, I will never make any statements about assumptions that one can do this and that, because this would not be in the spirit of Lagrange and uh, uh, one can only admire the, the, ge the, into, the even geometrical intuition Lagrange had 
to, to write down all these things. So to get around the difficulty to make assumptions f must be positive and so on, uh, what Lagrange does, he writes the function f equals zero. Uh, <coughs> This function he writes as Q is a function capital U of X, Y, Z, and P. So he starts from this differential equations. And then he looks for a, a function capital P of X, Y, and Z uh, so that P and Q with instead of P capital P inserted satisfy the equation that the elements are uh, form, form a surface element. So you have dz minus p dx minus q dy is zero. That means we want the green line underneath. Well, the idea is uh, if this green line were a total differential, uh, well, you would have a certain function whose total differential is zero, so this function should be constant. Uh, now life is not that easy, however there was a well developed idea that you can invent a multiplier capital M so that if you multiply this difference dz minus and so on with M then you get a total differential. So this is this line and if you integrate uh, you have the next line. And uh, well a solution z of u of x uh, of this differential equation, the green equation, is obtained then by dn equals zero. That means n as a function of x, y, z must be constant. What is n? n is the total differential of m It's the total differential of this. Of course, you don't know what m is, but there's no need to, to know this. Uh, now, if you want to find a function n such that uh, I missed something, sorry. I forgot the parenthesis. Uh, if you want to find such an M, uh, you need to know these three equations down there and uh, this leads to integrability conditions. These are the integrability conditions and uh, to show that these conditions that one can find a solution capital P of this equation dn equals multiplier times this term uh, is a single condition they write down the equations like this uh, but of course it means for uh, little p you have to insert capital P and for q you have to insert capital Q and for p in there capital P and so on. That's the uh, differential equation. And as I had mentioned briefly already earlier, at this point Euler had already arrived. He wrote down this important equation. P sub y minus q sub x minus p times qz plus q times pz equals zero. Uh, however, uh, if he noticed, he didn't mention it, 
But Lacanche mentions it and makes a strong statement. He said, if I look at this equation, then it's of this form. That it means it's linear in px, py, pz. So it's a quasi-linear equation for a function capital P. Uh, that seems to be more complicated because now from a differential equation with two independent variables x, y, you have arrived at a differential equation with three independent variables x, y, z. Uh, and Lacrange couldn't do anything with this. He stops uh, at this point and uh, now he does something which is uh, a little bit miraculous. He just says, okay, uh, I can find solutions of this equation. I can try to find them, uh, but it's better I smuggle in an unknown function, a general function f of alpha depending on a parameter, and then I slide over the solutions by making envelopes. That's what's behind this. So I have this equation and this equation, and I have to eliminate the variables and so on. I will not go into the detail. Uh, and then he proceeds in solving uh, the partial differential equations for certain cases. For instance, if q is a function of p, or a function of p and y, or a function of px, or a function of pz, or this complicated function, uh, nine different cases he solves. Uh, th that's all, and several cases had already been covered by Euler of this. So uh, that's the end of the story of, of this paper. And now I briefly recall what I had said before uh, that he had noted yeah I recall that he had noted that he had transformed the problem to a quasi-linear problem with one more variable and in the 79 paper uh, he invented a method which is completely different from what he had done before before it was all elimination and differentiation, or the other way around, making envelopes, envelopes. That was the great technical trick. Uh, here, he reduced the partial differential equations to a system of ordinary differential equations. That seems to be a method uh, invented by Lacrange. I'm not sure about that. my knowledge of the literature is not good enough. But uh, that's certainly a new trick if you want to solve a partial differential equation, you solve instead systems of ordinary differential equation. Jacobi reversed it in his famous method. He found a way by solving partial differential equations in certain cases depending on so and so many parameters and by differentiation he could solve uh, ordinary differential equation. That's Jacobi's famous method for solving, giving solutions of the Hamiltonian equations in certain cases. Uh, now, uh, Monge read what Lacrange had done and he introduced the so-called characteristics. These are certain lines and I will talk about them later, not here. And uh, in 1785, Lacrange uh, supplied a proof for this method. Uh, but at the same paper, he stated no method is known to solve the equation in general. And the year before, uh, Monge had done the same. Also, he clearly noted and commented and worked on Lacrange's procedure. Uh, here comes what I had said, uh, possibly he remembered that he had done it reading Sharpie's paper in 1793. Uh, 
and uh, well, then there comes Puff and Koshi, which I had already mentioned. Now I come briefly to see a 74 paper of of Lagrange. He introduced the notion of complete solution, particular solution, general solution, singular solution. Uh, when one uh, reads modern books, uh, for instance like Kamke, which I don't like at all, uh, but Kamke says it's all useless, uh, which is maybe a statement too strong. One has to understand what Lagrange was doing at, at that time. So if you uh, think of elements x, y, z points and then positions p, q of a plane over there, these are five parameters. If you put an equation f equals zero on that, you reduce one parameter so you have four degrees of freedom. Now the splendid idea uh, Lagrange has, you look for solutions depending on two variables and you involve two essential parameters u and p. So you have four variables. So all the line elements which are moving around uh, must sit in such a complete solution. And now you have just to arrange things in such a way that you um, take families of something and uh, you get all possible solutions. And then he imagines the following. Uh, assume you had such a solution depending on two uh, essential parameters A and B. Case one would be you have a solution which agrees with star for one specific value of A and B. Okay, then it's a, what he calls a particular solution of this family of solutions, two parameter family of solutions of the problem. Or case two, uh, he selects from this two parameter, parameter family, he selects a one parameter family uh, by fixing an arbitrary function omega of a and b being zero or maybe b equals f of a to connect it with the notation from the what I talked before and uh, so this is the a b plane it's a line given by this and to this line corresponds a one parameter family of surfaces and then you take the envelopes and so two infinitesimally close uh, functions from this family will intersect or touch, touch is maybe not the right word, intersect in a certain line and this is the characteristic. Uh, but it's quite complicated to see this anyway. Uh, you form uh, you form the envelope and you arrive at such system of equations and from eliminating the parameter out of it you get uh, a certain solution which depends uh, on this arbitrary function f of a. Or the third case is, so either it is an element surface of the family or it's an envelope of a an one parameter family or it touches all of them in discrete in one point or discrete points. That, that is the case three. So then you have this family and you get these two extra equations F differentiated with respect to A and with respect to B it's always zero and you eliminate and uh, that gives the so-called uh, singular solution. So you have a particular solution, then you have uh, solutions which de 
depend on an arbitrary function f of a. Uh, this is what Lagrange calls the general solution. And then you have this singular stuff which touches uh, all the elements in one or many discrete points. Now the question is, how precise is this? Sophus Lee follows this faithfully, uh, but I don't trust him completely <laughs> that he had discussed really carefully all cases. I think uh, someone sh might go through this and uh, of course at later places he says there are this uh, degenerate cases and this degenerate cases and so on and if it's a linear equation uh, then the monk cones uh, degenerate and so on but let me not go into these details because for the main uh, procedure which I will discuss this is not uh, so relevant uh, this plausibility of the geometric reasoning. Uh, one statement is of course you can have other complete solutions and if you do the same in the case of so-called general solutions, this envelope construction, you get the same solutions but in a different representation. Uh, and uh, well, how to get uh, general solutions? Uh, I should not have said general solution. Uh, I should have said uh, complete. Sorry. Let me say a word about this, but just uh, to tell you what happens in the second case of this so-called general solutions. Uh, if you go to the AB plane and you take two different curves in the AB plane, one defined by omega 1 and the second by omega 2 and suppose they touch in a certain point uh, then to the curves correspond surfaces, two different surfaces and to this point uh, corresponds a line which lies in uh, both surfaces and this is the characteristic. You get it from the differential equations by inserting these points and uh, Lee gives a very beautiful picture in his book about the situation of this but let me go now briefly to the linear and quasi-linear equation uh, which I think is known to all of you who have ever looked at partial differential equations uh, First, the, the simplest case is the homogeneous linear equation. Uh, you have n independent variables and you have a vector field A with n components and uh, you look at the partial differential operators a k d x k uh, summation with respect to k. Lee calls this the symbol of the vector field. Nowadays one says this is a vector field uh, in the notion of uh, differential operators. Uh, it seems that Lee has introduced this notion as first. And then you can write uh, equation one just in the form apply the operator A to U. There should, it should come out that this is zero. And uh, so what Lacanche proposes is introduce the system of characteristic equations. So these are n uh, ordinary differential equations. x dot dot is the diff derivative with respect to the parameter t. Uh, and that should be a 
of capital X. So A composed with X. Uh, system of N ordinary differential equations. And the, the first thing one notices, uh, I'm not going into details of the proof. These are so very more or less, it's more the idea to see it than of following the proof is if u is a solution of equation 1, uh, then uh, u composed with any solution of this differential equation is constant. Constant for all times. Of course, uh, different initial values, different things. Uh, so that's this, uh, the linear equation and the quasi-linear equation is the next thing. So the components of the vector field now depend not only on x but also on u. And there's instead of zero a right hand side p of x and u. And you attach with this the simple which is the next uh, differential operator. You add b times partial derivative with respect to z and uh, instead of this equation you add an n plus 1's equation z dot as a function of t should be b of composed with x of t and z of t and the theorem is uh, basically proved in the same simple way as the first theorem. U solves uh, equation 3 if on only if on every uh, point of the surface z equals u of x. Uh, for every such point there is a characteristic curve which runs through this point uh, and uh, which lies on the curve. So z of t equals u of x and t. And uh, now, uh, then Lagrange makes the following statement that these equations for the uh, these characteristic equations for for the quasi-linear equation uh, above for the quasi-linear equation three are as well if you go to the linear case uh, is one more variable you introduce one more independent variable z and you write this linear equation with one more variable. The characteristic lines of this are the same as the characteristic lines uh, of the quasi-linear equation. So uh, three, three and five should be somehow connected. And in fact, it turns out, I give just one part of the theorem, uh, if W is a solution of this equation, of this linear equation with one more independent variable, and it has a derivative with respect to the last variable z being not zero, then the solutions which you get from resolving this equation w of x u of x equals alpha alpha an arbitrary constant satisfy the quasi-linear system and you can go back that's the converse of this and so uh, you have a way to connect quasi-linear equations with systems of ordinary equations and then the idea is uh, 
But this is not the way how Lagrange proceeds, but it's the way how uh, Cauchy later proceeds. Uh, you, you have to find complete solutions uh, going over the linear or quasi-linear equations. And how do you get complete solutions? You have to integrate the system of characteristic lines. And there comes into the game Cauchy's idea, you solve initial value problems. Therefore, it's called Cauchy's problem. And uh, so, so the idea is, say, for two independent variables, you pick yourself a curve, gamma, it's this green curve, and gamma sub bar. It's the projection into the x-plane. Uh, the green curve sits as a graph above this. And then you are looking for lines, x of capital X and z of capital Z. These are the characteristic lines, solutions of the system. And you build your solution of the independent variables by forming all the characteristic lines and taking them together and you get uh, a solution of the Cauchy problem which is written here. Now for the nonlinear problem it's more complicated so I do not want to show this uh, in detail here but I go immediately to the uh, general nonlinear problem. look at the problem to solve the differential equation such that one prescribes uh, initial values on a, on a certain curve gamma bar that was from this curve in space the projection down onto the x plane. Now let me give a little bit uh, of notation so the Rn, where the independent variables are, I call m sub bar. That's the Rn. Uh, that's the base space. And above the base space sits the configuration space, where the surface lies. And then you, uh, you add the, the directions, p. And there you get to the contact space m hat. And uh, here you see the variables x, z, p and you introduce the contact form uh, on this space and uh, x, z, p I call surface elements. One has to imagine there's a certain point and then a plane to this point in which has directions. Uh, we are in non-parametric representation so there are two, uh, uh, two variables uh, in two dimensions or n p in, in n variables and uh, these are the surface elements and then uh, following the notation of, of Sophus Lee uh, one introduces the r-dimensional element complex he calls it element Verein. these are mappings from a r-dimensional parameter space p into the contact space with the values A of C, S of C, that's the value of Z, and B of C, these are the values of P. And uh, that this is an element complex, means the pullback of the differential form omega uh, is zero, meaning in these variables that ds minus bk dak is zero. And uh, now this element fine element complex may degenerate but uh, Lee introduces uh, a kind of regular version of this he calls an n-dimensional strip and a strip and streifen that means 
E is supposed to be also an immersion. An immersion is uh, a generalization of a function. For instance, in one dimension, uh, Lee always sees an, uh, something not just as a, a collection of points, but at the same time of the directions. So a curve is a collection of points or it's the envelope of its line elements. But of course you might also have this as a strip. Why is this a very natural notation? Just imagine you have, uh, you have a strip which looks like this. And you shrink this, make it smaller and smaller, you shrink it to one point, well, then you get to such a thing. And if you want to move freely in geometric space and don't want to have singular cases, uh, you have to admit this as uh, regular stuff. And that's what, uh, what uh, Lee does. Okay, after this little bit of notation, uh, we get to the characteristic equations in the general case. Uh, to get to the characteristic equations in the general case uh, is not completely easy. In, in Lee Schaeffer's it takes a long time to get there. But Carl Theodori gives a beautiful uh, brief discussion. So let's assume uh, we have the contact graph of a solution, x, u of x, and gradient of u, x, u of x. And assume you have a curve sigma t lying on the contact graph. That means if you insert in u x and in gradient u of x, x, you get z and p. And if you differentiate this with respect to t, uh, you get z, uh, u of x, x dot, but u of x is p. So this gives the first line. And differentiating the second equation, you get this. And differentiating the differential equation with respect to x, k, you get this line of equation. And uh, Insert uh, for x of t, u of t, x t, and u of x, x t, you get this equation. And uh, uh, from the second line, you get this equation, and you add this to this, and you get to this equation. And here comes the beautiful thing. If you assume that the projection of the curve uh, x of t, z of t, p of t into the base space is given in this way by choosing the parameter in the right way, then the parenthesis disappears and you end up with the fact that this is uh, zero. And so you get to these equations. Uh, this was the assumption how the parametrizations should be chosen. Uh, then the first equation, and from three, the first equation gives this scalar equation. And uh, from this line, you get this equation. Uh, so here you see uh, Cauchy's famous equation for the so-called characteristic strips. These are Cauchy's equation. Let me jump ahead just for a moment.
look at the equations star. They look like Cauchy's equation x. The first and the third is the same. Only the third is a difference. And what is subtracted is minus f. That's all. But completely different equations, of course, if you put such a thing. Why are these equations remarkable? These equations generate one parameter groups of contact transformations. This was the discovery of uh, Sophus Lee that you have one scalar equation, f of n plus 1 variables, and uh, you end up to generate a one parameter group as a flow of certain vector field, you end up with looking at these equations. And uh, Lee noticed, he was very proud of this, that he could do Cauchy's method in a more geometric way uh, by looking at contact transformations. Well, my feeling was that Cara Theodori considered this all as crap. And, uh, he was not very much interested in contact transformations. And he writes in this book, Der mühsame Apparat der Kontakttransformationen. It's a, it's a cumbersome apparatus of the contact transformations is eliminated in my book. But of course, uh, you lose something. And uh, it's nice to have the complete picture and, in fact, uh, uh, wonderful things come out of it, but I have not the time to talk about this. Uh, but I should mention, if you look at the third, the third and the first equation, and if you assume that f, the box, does not depend on the in of the variable z, so it's only depending on x and p, then and if you uh, right instead of f h, you get x dot equals h of p and p yeah and that's a mistake uh, A minus sign is missing, minus f of x. So the derivative with respect of f with respect to z is 0. You get p dot is minus f of x. That means you have the Hamiltonian system of equations. That means the Lie equations in this specific case uh, degenerate if you take the first and the last to the system of Hamilton equations and uh, so that governs the system of optics and the system of point mechanics. And of course the equation in the middle has even then a meaning, but I'm not going into what the meaning is. Uh, uh, so let me return. to an end pretty soon, so I cannot give you all, in, all details. Uh, uh, the idea is you start with a curve gamma, which is given as a graph of a function phi sitting over a base curve gamma sub, gamma sub bar. And that's the curve the blue curve gamma, which lies in n plus 1 dimension space. And now the idea is uh, you have to solve the differential equation f equals 0. You somehow want to make out, to, out of the curve a one dimensional strip. That means you have to invent surface elements. These are these blue, these uh, black elements, and you make you, you try to extend the curve to a, what uh, Lee calls an integral strip. 
and then uh, each element of this strip you take and take as the initial values of system of characteristic strips. These are what moves along this red line, that's the carrier of these green strips. And this you do with every black one, and then you have to show that it's uh, joined together to a surface, to a regular surface. If you have done that, well, you cannot go too far because this stuff will intermingle and cross and so on. But for a certain while, if you start out in a regular case, you have the, the complete thing. And, uh, well, the first observation is if you look at uh, what one might call the Lee symbol, uh, here is the vector field of the, of the, Cauchy, of the Cauchy equations, uh, fp, pfp, minus fx, p, here is the minus sign I had forgotten before. Uh, and you form this dif differential operator in two n plus one variables, and you apply it to f, you see that f on a solution of the Cauchy system is constant. Along every strip, f is constant for all times. Uh, it's just a one-line computation, which I have written down here. So it's not a great thing. And of course, you see, this does not work anymore if you add minus f in the second position. So the reasoning must be different in this case. And uh, so here come the boundary conditions. Well, now it becomes really cumbersome, and uh, I should go on quickly. And you have to believe me more or less that everything functions. You have to make uh, certain assumptions that you can start with at least in one point. And uh, that's what is written down here. And uh, the extension problem for the, the initial line to, to an integral strip sits into these two equations. These are n plus, n, sorry, this, these equations, the second one are n minus 1 equations and 1. So these are n equations for n unknown functions p. a and s are the initial values of the given uh, initial curve and uh, b is the unknown extension to an integral strip. So this uh, is this and now you have to look at determinants and uh, rank business and so on. Uh, uh, it's beautiful stuff, but uh, I just show you the picture without <laughs> uh, uh, discussing the whole thing. It ends up with the stating after have looking very carefully, one can make the extension. Uh, and when this is done, Uh, one formulates the theorem, so assume that all these assumptions are satisfied, then the Cauchy problem can be solved. Uh, I have left out some details uh, how this solution is specified about this certain point x not z not p not, and so on. And the proof, and this is Cauchy's beautiful invention, the proof runs you look at such a characteristic strip, which I call uh, little sigma, and uh, I compose the function f, the box, with sigma, and the claim is the derivative disappears. Well, this is what I had stated before. Uh, 
And if you take the pullback of the omega form, uh, then you, because of the first one, you have no dt in this expression. And the lambdas, which appear in here, are an inhomogeneous linear differential equation of first order for the lambdas. And this is the point uh, which makes Cauchy's construction work. Uh, I show you just one case. So here are the, the initial values time t equals t of c uh, is what I take. And the strip condition is e, the pullback of omega with e is zero. And uh, that we have an integral initial strip means that the pullback of f is zero. And uh, here comes the second lemma. Uh, which states if we have an n minus one dimensional integral strip which extends gamma uh, and the sigma are the characteristic strips for each element of this n minus one dimensional integral strip then we get an n minus one family of characters characteristic strips with the right initial values and they pull back the pullback of the, or say, on, this, on the strip, the solution, the differential equation is satisfied and the pullback of omega is zero. So it looks as if everything is achieved. However, we are not, have not yet arrived as regular curves or the generalization of this as regular solutions, but we might still stay with uh, singular stuff of this. Uh, sort and uh, uh, and how does the proof run? I just show you the second part. Uh, here is Cauchy's differential equation, uh, and what's on the right hand side is proved by the first arguments that this is zero. And now you take the pullback with the, with the initial values, and it turns out that the lambdas are zero at the beginning. And uh, because you have a homogeneous linear differential equation, that's a beautiful argument. It might have appeared here for the first time. You have a linear equation, and it's a uniqueness argument if you have this, the trivial solution, uh, and uh, then the initial values are zero, then it must be zero altogether. And that gives this, and therefore the pullback is zero. Uh, well, and then we get to the end. Now we have first to show that this thing is a strip that is really not a generate. That means, again, looking at determinants. So we have to show that the rank of this stuff is uh, n, and uh, I have skipped all the discussion of this. And now we get to the end of the proof. Uh, well, because of this, instead of the n variables t and c, one introduces x as variable. And this locally functions because this one proves that such a determinant is different from zero. And then one inverts uh, x, which is locally then a diffeomorphism, and takes an inverse, little f, to invert this. And then one decomposes the, the strip with this inverse. And that should give the solution, and it gives the solution. Uh, I'll just show you one, one page. So here we take the inverse of x, 
this is F, so we form instead of T, uh, C, we form F of little f and P of P little f composed. Uh, and then of course, uh, because we know already the second line, we get composed with F, we get this, this is zero and so this is already the differential equation. And we just have to show that P of X is in fact the derivative of U with respect to X. Okay, a little again of pullback and then one has to show that one has the right uh, initial elements and that's the end of the story. And I think uh, this is such a beautiful proof. Uh, Lacan should have liked it. Uh, thank you for your attention. I give you a function u, which is uh, smooth and is satisfied. F satisfied. equals zero, g. Yeah, f equals zero, g equals zero. Two okay. equations of that type. Yeah. Now, you ha need to so, uh, prove that under certain conditions, for instance, f should not be equal to j, this solution is isolated. This, this is it is an isolated solution. In other words, if one, if, uh, in other words, if you have two equations for one uh, if one so if one function satisfies two PDEs, yeah. then it may exist, but it has to be isolated in general. You see, in general is in yeah. the term sense and so on. But if it's a, the obvious situation, I mean, if one point satisfies two equations, then it has to be isolated. And more now, I know the answer to that one because the Meyer bracket that you find in Caratteodori. But if you do it, if you ask the same questions. Uh, uh, for three, in other words, if two equations u and v satisfy a system of three, then it's much more complicated. But in other words, do you know, uh, what do you think of this problem? Am yeah. I being clear? Well, yeah, yeah. I have uh, one answer showing my non-knowledge. That means uh, one certainly has to look at uh, at Jacobi or, or Meyer and this beautiful work with uh, the commutators they are doing. And uh, secondly, just a remark to caution is, of course, if one thinks of Hans Levy's example, uh, two or more equations are very different from one equation. And even in the differentiable case, if you have two equations, you might have no solution. No solution at all. Yeah, but this is different. I know, I give you you, and I know a priori that there are solutions. Yeah. Yeah, that, okay. uh, so it's different. That removes my second. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. you have that. And my answer to the first one is I don't know. Yeah, but it's a very interesting question and it should be known, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, you're perfectly right for y Meyer and Jacobi, yeah. but it doesn't work. It works for uh, uh, one and two, but it doesn't work for two and three. Uh -huh. It does not. Sorry. No, 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 it's okay, but yeah. it's a perfectly okay. But I mean, it's such a nice question and yeah. the answer. And if you ask, I'm sure uh, Jack Winter here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that my little lecture even inspires such a beautiful question. 